Hey guys, welcome to another video. In this video, I'll be going over the efficient debt paper. This is a follow up paper on the efficient net. Efficient net just tackles the problem of classification, whereas efficient debt tackles more dense prediction tasks like object detection and segmentation. I have a video on efficient net, so if you haven't checked it out, you can check it out. I cover everything about the efficient net in a lot of detail in that, but I will briefly cover everything that's relevant for efficient debt over here. Just as efficient net tried to tackle the problem of efficient classification, efficient debt does the same but for detection and segmentation. Now generally state of the art object detectors are very computationally intensive and people keep on trying to push the state of the art without thinking much about efficiency. Now this is a problem because we generally have to deploy these detectors in low constraint environments like uh, in a robot or in a self driving car and so on. So it's very important for these to be efficient to actually be usable in the real world. And this paper tries to do this by tackling two problems. One is efficient multi-scale feature fusion and the second is model scaling. So first let's just get a feel of the problem of multi-scale feature fusion. So generally when you look at detection or segmentation architectures, you have some kind of encoder decoder framework where you have a single encoding pathway and then you have a decoding pathway that takes in features from the encoder. Now what is problematic in this in these types of architectures is that you only create these low level features once. So to illustrate this as with an example, imagine that you at this early stage detect circle in your image and later on at this stage you find out that there was actually a face at that location. Now that you know it's a face, it's quite unlikely that there was a circle. It's more likely that there was an oval which represents an eye. So we should go back and we should ideally correct the low level feature that we uh, previously determined. But this doesn't happen in these encoder decoder frameworks because there's just one down pathway and one up pathway. So the PA net was one of the first papers to address this problem. Uh, they added another pyramid after the encoder and decoder which basically allows your low level features to be reconsidered now that you have this global context from the second branch of your network. And they say that this helps improve segmentation and detection because you have a much more accurate rich hierarchy where your global features have informed your local features and these local features are important for dense prediction tasks with, with which we are concerned over here. Another paper that tried to address the same problem was the R-Glass paper. So the R-Glass is a repeated stack of encoder decoders and the idea is that the global features over here would go ahead and influence the local features over here which would then influence the global features here which would then again influence the local features here. And so in this structure you have local and global features continually talking to each other and one is able to reconsider itself in the context of the other. So their whole aim is that the local and global cues should be tightly integrated to form a holistic representation of the image. This will lead to very accurate low level features and that's exactly what we want for dense prediction tasks. Finally we have the HR net and instead of arranging the different levels in series which is one after the other over here you have them arranged in parallel and so you have a certain number of layers of processing and then you have these fusion layers which allow every layer to talk to every other layer and then again you have certain layers of processing and then again you have these fusion blocks. So this allows low level and high level representations to talk to each other in a very dense manner and this creates a very rich feature hierarchy. And this creates a very rich feature hierarchy at a very high resolution. And this high resolution is again important for our dense prediction task. So now let's get to model scaling. As said earlier, we don't just introduce one model but a family of models so that people with uh, their different use cases can pick the one that they prefer. Now there are multiple ways to scale up models. Uh, one thing that we can do is width scaling which is we can increase the number of channels in each of the layers. The second is depth scaling so we can increase the number of layers in the network. This is usually what is done in things like ResNet 18, ResNet 34 and so on. You primarily just increase the depth. The third is resolution scaling so you pass in a higher resolution image uh, so that you have more fine grained patterns than before. And, and finally the last is compound scaling which the efficient net paper explored which is scaling all these three factors simultaneously to scale up your model. 
So once we have a good baseline, we can use these scaling techniques to create a family of models. The efficient net paper finds a good baseline, the efficient net B0 using auto ML. The efficient net B0 contains only depth-wise separable convolutions. It has no 3 cross 3 convolutions. Therefore, it is very, very computationally efficient. It only contains mobile net V2 blocks, which are called MB cons. MB cons are able to efficiently create features by having a bottleneck structure and a residual connection in each block. But instead of sending features to a lower dimensional space, as is common in bottleneck layers, they send features to a higher dimensional space. MB cons create features in a three step process. Firstly, they use one cross one convolutions to send the input feature map into a higher dimensional space. Then they use three cross three cross one convolutions to do feature creation in this higher resolution uh, dimensional space. And then finally, they use the residual addition to enrich the input feature map. So we have three stages. One is feature selection, feature creation, and then feature enrichment. If you would like to know more about this, I have a video mobile net v2 and efficient net in which I cover the MB con blocks and the efficient net in a lot of detail. So you can check that out. So once we have a good baseline architecture found by the neural architecture search, which was efficient at B0, we can use the compound scaling technique, which is simultaneously increasing the uh, input resolution depth and a number of channels to create a whole family of models, which we, which is called the efficient net series. So finally, here is the efficient net architecture. Uh, it looks a bit scary, but don't worry, we'll break it down. So there are three main components here. The first is the efficient net backbone, uh, and this could have been any backbone like a ResNet or VGG or so on. The, sec the third is the uh, classification or the prediction head. And the second is this bi FPN layer, which stands for bidirectional feature pyramid network. So let's see what happens here is that we pass an image and we pass it through this backbone and from this backbone right before every max pool we extract the feature. Uh, so we get this featured pyramid from our backbone and then we pass this pyramid into this uh, by FPN layer and you can see that we have essentially these repeating by FPN layers and then finally we use the last output pyramid to finally make a prediction. So now let's see how this by FPN layer tries to tackle the a multi-scale feature fusion problem we spoke about earlier. So here you have a regular FPN and this takes in some feature pyramid uh, from some encoder and then you just have one path of decoding in which you uh, just upsample features and then you make your final predictions. And then we spoke about the PA net which says that uh, we need to reconsider these lower level features. So uh, the problem here is that when we directly make predictions from these features, they don't have space to reconsider themselves. They have to be geared for uh, your downstream task. Whereas in this case, because you have this one extra layer going downwards, these features get a bit of breathing room to update themselves. And then with these updated features, you're going to recreate your feature pyramid. And now you're going to make predictions from this recreated pyramid. Uh, the by FPN looks quite similar to the PA net and in many ways it, it it's almost completely the same. It just has a few differences. So the first key difference that is quite visible is that there are these uh, nodes missing over here. The second key difference is that there are these skip connections which are added. Uh, and the third key difference is that this is now a repeating block. So the first of these decisions was more of a design choice. So removing these two nodes over here, the authors basically say uh, if a node has only one input edge with no feature fusion, then it will have less contribution to the feature network. So what they're saying is that you can see this new node over here. Yeah, in the PNet, this just takes in one input, which is from the P7 at the same level. Uh, compare it with this new node over here, it takes in, in an input from this P7 as well as from P6. So therefore, there is a feature fusion of different scales happening. So they just decide to remove the nodes where there's just one level input. The second is that they add these skip connections. Now why these skip connections are important is that let's say that I have some really good features over here and I want to carry on these features to my final classification head. If I don't use skip connections then essentially my 3 cross 3 or my depth wise separable convolutions over here have to remember these features and then they just have to propagate them ahead. So I'm using operations to just 
carry on things ahead instead of creating new features uh, by instead using skip connections I can just carry on what I had previously so that all of these operations over here can be now used for creating new features or enhancing my features so these the, uh, skip connections also help make these networks more efficient and require less parameters uh, the third is is that PANet only had one uh, top down pathway so they decide to repeat the top down pathway multiple times uh, so if you look at this example you can argue over here that uh, why do we only have uh, one bottom up pathway where only one time the low level features get to reconsider themselves maybe we should uh, let the low level features reconsider themselves then create deep features then again make the low level features reconsider themselves and so on and go in a cycle uh, this is similar to also what we saw in the HR net over here right you can see that you have these fusion no uh, fusion layers where everything talks to everything and gets to reconsider uh, this is also similar to our glass where all these get to talk to each other repeatedly so their idea of repetition is essentially to allow these low level and high level features to continuously interact and update each, each other features in each node are created through uh, adding the inputs and then passing this addition into a convolutional block so for example over here I would add in p6 to a resize version of p7 and then pass it through a con block so two things to keep in mind here if any of the inputs to a node have different number of channels then we would also pass that through a one cross one convolution so that at each level or everything has the same number of channels so for example in this case when p7 is coming to p6 this resize operation would include one one cross one convolution to match the number of channels and one spatial resize to match the resolution the convolution operation used over here is just a regular 3 cross 3 convolution so the nb cons are used in the backbone whereas the by fpn has 3 cross 3 convolutions now you may also notice that some of the nodes are used many times for example p6 was used for the computation at this node and also for this node and it was also used to construct p7 uh, so for example in the encoder p7 uses p6 and when this block repeats this will become the new p6 and as you can see here p7 did use p6 so p6 is being used in three places this is kind of over constraining p6 so it could be that p6 only has features that are useful for p7 and it's not really useful here also be that at this level features of a lower level are not required you know this node may just want to look at p6 and ignore p7 so we would like to give our network the flexibility to decide what nodes it wants to look at our current setup does not allow for this so what the authors do is that they introduce weights for each of the inputs to every node so for example over here we have two inputs so we would assign two weights w1 and w2 to each of these nodes then the network can learn w1 and w2 based on the data that it sees the authors call this weight feature fusion and it's simply adding weights to the inputs of the nodes now we, we usually normalize these weights that we want them to sum to 1 because that has better convergence properties uh, it's important to keep in mind here that these are static weights these are not attention weights so in attention generally we learn the weights conditioned on some input whereas over here w1 and w2 are just fixed so if w1 was like 0.3 the network would always pay like 30% attention to uh, the p6 input and 70 percent attention to the p7 input so the authors explore different ways of computing this weight function so say you have a set of weights w1 to wn uh, one option would just be to multiply the weight by the input and just sum them up now this is not good because in this case your w's will not sum to one so this can cause some instability because w is potentially unbounded uh, the, the most common approach that people take is softmax fusion where you would basically apply the softmax function to renormalize the weights uh, unfortunately softmax can lead to significant slowdown on GPU hardware so the authors introduce this fast normalized fusion which is basically a simpler version of softmax where you just take the weight learned for one node and you divide by the sum of all the weights so this effectively means that you know you would multiply 
uh, each of the incoming nodes by some weight and then you would divide the total by the sum of the weights. So all the weights effectively uh, you know would sum to 1. So this would be actually W1 upon W1 plus W2 and this would be uh, W2 upon W1 plus W2. So this you know this kind of adds the interpretation that uh, the network is, may pay like 40 percent attention to this and 60 percent of attention to this and so on. So the node may pay uh, that attention. So with this new detail these are how the computation equations look. So for this node we have two incoming nodes uh, and we would assign each of them a weight and then we would divide by the sum of the weights. Uh, for this node we have three incoming nodes. Uh, so you have one, two and three. So you have P6, P6TD and P5 and you have weights associated with each and you divide by the sum. So that was all about the architecture of the network. You have this uh, efficient net backbone with NB cons. You have this repeating by FPN layer which encourages multi-scale feature fusion. You also have these uh, weights which are learned to encourage better inf information flow throughout the network. Now we come to the second main topic which is scaling. So once you have a good baseline, now you want you know larger versions of this network. So the efficient net paper explodes scaling in quite a bit of depth and uh, here they come up with a heuristic based scaling method to scale the uh, pi FPN layers. So from the efficient net paper we have many efficient net models of you know different complexities and we use the scaling method that was introduced in that paper. And so we already have a family of efficient net backbones from there. So all we need to do is really to change the uh, hyperparameters of this these by FPN layers uh, as we change from one backbone to the other. So the authors use this heuristic based scaling. So because grid search for object detection is much more expensive compared to grid search for classification, uh, they won't do the grid search that they did in the efficient net paper. They will just scale the by FPN. Uh, according to these three you know heuristically derived equations uh, these are better understood through an example so let's see some examples so again we have a family of models from d0 to d7 uh, let phi be the level of model we are talking about starting at 0 so at our first base model we have an input size of 512 and the input resolution is governed by this equation so each level we go up we increase the input size by 128 uh, the backbone that we are going to use is again from the efficient net series and we are just going to use the corresponding efficient net you know level backbone. The number of channels in the by FPN is given by this equation. So uh, sorry I think I made a mistake earlier when I said that two levels may have different number of features. Uh, that actually does not happen. So when you have this initial feature pyramid from the encoder you are going to convert everything into the same number of channels. So you know for D0 you would convert all, all of these features to 64 number of channels and your entire by FPN would work uh, only in 64 channels. So your baseline model has 64 channels and then each level you go up you are going to multiply 64 by 1.35. So you are increasing uh, by 35% each level up. Then the number of repetitions that you have of the by FPN start at 3 and at each level they go up by 1. So they've made some uh, slight adjustments so they are not exactly following this equation because probably at this level they are hitting some compute uh, limitation. So they start to increase it a bit slowly but and they start at 3 and they go up by 1 for the starting models. And the number of convolutions in your final prediction head uh, also start at 3 and they go up by 1 every 3 levels up. Finally let's look at some of their experimentation results. So here they've clubbed and compared models at similar uh, MAP score ranges. So if you uh, look into any score range you would find that their, their model uses much fewer parameters than other models. Uh, 
uh, it's much faster than flops the gpu latency is much lesser and so is the cpu latency uh, so this table is pretty self-evident and uh, just overall you will find that their models use less parameters they are faster on the gpus and cpus and they consume less flops so you can look in, into this in more detail if you want so this is another slide showing the same thing uh, that as you want a higher and higher MAP other models have to scale up their parameters and latency considerably whereas efficient that is much more uh, you know, efficient when it comes to these things and they also do some ablation studies on the backbone and their design of the FPN also on the uh, weird feature fusion so you can look in the paper for more of these comparisons so thank you for watching the video hope you got what you were looking for uh, if you have any questions or requests, you can please uh, leave it in the comments. And uh, thanks for watching.